Hello, welcome to KPFA's local station board candidate debate. Um, here today, this is candidate debate number one. We are with three candidates, Sharon Adams, Bill Campisi, and Chris Corey. Um, so before we start, I'm going to request a that they each introduce themselves. They have one minute each to introduce themselves. And um, so, Sharon Adams. Hello, I'm Sharon Adams, and I'm running for re-election to the KPFA Local Station Board. I'm currently serving on the Local Station Board, and I was elected about three years ago. I'm treasurer on the Local Station Board right now. Um, KPFA and Pacifica stand at a critical crossroads with a $3.2 million loan to Pacifica that's been secured by the KPFA Studio Building as well as other uh, properties within the Pacifica Foundation network. Um, right now, there is no apparent plan to repay that loan and um, except for vague statements about refinancing the loan. So I am committed to keeping KPFA and Pacifica financially sound and saving the uh, KPFA studio building. And so I hope that you will vote for me to be reelected to the KPFA local station board. Thank you. Uh, Bill Campisi? Yeah, hi. I also am a member of the local station board. Uh, I've been a member uh, for about three years, so I'm running for re-election like Sharon. Um, for one brief period of time, I was also uh, a member of the national board. Um, I found it a very disturbing experience and I resigned. Um, I think the national board is a, a very problematic structure in Pacifica and I think it needs to be reorganized. And I have been working on bylaws with other people that would change the way that Pacifica is structured. I'll probably talk about that more later tonight as we go along. That's my primary focus. I'm also concerned about the $3.2 million loan, which I think, well, anyway, I, I'll, I'll talk about this more as we go on tonight. Thank you. Chris Corey? My name is Chris Corey. Uh, this is uh, also my second round with the local station board. Um, I also have the, um, the unfortunate um, uh, um, obligation to uh, serve on the national board as well. Um, I'm also um, a chair of the uh, National Finance Committee. And so um, I'm, I'm with uh, Bill and Sharon on the issue of the $3.2 million loan. It's kind of my primary focus. It's the whole reason that I'm running again. Um, when I first joined um, three years ago, my focus was to bring my uh, business experience into, into KPFA because most people don't have my background. And um, I thought it might be of value to the organization. But now that the loan is here and needs to um, be upped when it comes due in about a year, um, I wanted to be here, wanted to be around for that. So that's my primary reason for running again. Thank you. Uh, before delving into the format, I just wanted to speak on behalf of two candidates that could not be here tonight. Susan De Silva. I regret that I cannot be there tonight. I was chair of the local board when the current bylaws were written. We didn't all agree, but in the end, we produced results. Now the bylaws need to be rewritten to provide a more workable structure with sm smaller boards and clearer lines of authority. I can help do that. I'm also very interested in getting KPFA and Pacifica's financial affairs in order by working with the other station boards to come up with a plan to cover outstanding debts. Preci precious assets like our studio building and KPFA's building, sorry, LA's building, which also houses the archives, are at risk. As it happens, I believe I can work very productively with the other members of this panel, so I hope you will vote for me and for these other candidates as well. That was Susan De Silva. Uh, another candidate, Mark Van Landwit. KPFA is important. KPFA matters. KPFA is needed. Independent journalism is important. Truth is important. The voices of the people are important. KPFA is needed now more than ever. KPFA listeners are important. KPFA's future is important. We have so much to do. Please support KPFA's future. Please support United for Independent Radio Coalition candidates for the board. So um, now moving on, I'll, I'll explain the structure briefly and then we'll start. Um, 
we're going to start with Sharon and then we're going to iterate through each of you and you will be assigned a, a question randomly which comes from a sequence that I generated ahead of time and um, from a master list of questions which was compiled from questions of historical importance as well as those submitted by candidates and uh, listener members. And you will have one minute to address the question, then each of you will have one minute to follow up, and you'll have another minute to readdress the question. Um, so to start, the first number we have here is question five. Um, do the managers at KPFA and Pacifica get enough support to do their jobs? If not, what would you change to give them that support? Sharon Adams, you can start. That is kind of it. Interesting question. Um, I feel, feel like the local station board does uh, support the management, at least the majority of the local station board does support the management. Um, I believe that it is important to support management because they make the decisions uh, about the station and how to bring it forward. And it's very difficult to make decisions by committee. Um, so I'm not entirely, I would say the best way to support the management in the future might be to change the uh, bylaws because as the current structure stands, there's very uh, diffuse authority and diffuse lines of authority. So it's difficult to um, sometimes know how proper management should go. Uh, but I do support management. Thank you. Um, Bill Campisi? Well, what the question raises for me is the issue of the relationship of the local station board members, the elected members of the local station board, and uh, management, and what, um, whether or not the local station board should have direct control over management decisions of our radio station. I am of the group of people on the, on the LSB who believe that we have to let the manager, our manager, Quincy at this time, manage the radio station and let the, he and the program director uh, decide on programming decisions. Um, I view our role, or I view the LSB's role, as one where we want to, we want to look at the overall picture and see if the station is progressing in the right direction. If it's not progressing in the right direction, we're not going to make management decisions. We'll change the manager. I think that's our role. We're not supposed to be in, in into the mix of day-to-day -day decisions at the station. That's how, I, that's how I view it. So we best support management by looking at a broad picture of what's going on at the station and, and determining whether it's being successful or not. Thank you. Chris Court. Yeah, in some ways, uh, the, other, the other two are tripping over this question for the same reason that I'm going to, namely that, that the, the line of authority is such that the um, LSB isn't actually responsible for managing the manager or even recommending things to the manager. The manager is supposed to have basically complete autonomy, and our responsibility, our obligation, is to review the manager and make sure that the manager is doing an effective job. And if the manager is not doing an effective job, our responsibility is to vote to replace him. But um, beyond that, our authority is extremely limited to interfere, to obligate, to, to suggest uh, what management should do. Uh, that having been said, um, if, we were, if, if we were more, I guess, in order to, in order to um, have any influence on the manager, we would have to uh, have a stronger review process than we currently do, uh, which is, I think, a fairly weak link in that chain. Thank you. Um, Sharon, you can readdress. Well, I do find the question kind of odd. I'm looking at it again. Um, do the managers at KPFA and Pacifica get enough support to do their job? I think that would be a question to ask them, honestly. I mean, I, it, that's why I was sort of, you know, didn't quite know what to say to it. And um, Chris and Bill are both exactly right. You know, our, I happen to bring the bylaws and, you know, we have all these things that we can do, but we really have nothing that we can do as far as management except review annually and um, hire and fire, which is drastic. You know, so just in terms of day-to-day -day management, we don't have a lot of input in that. That's all I have to say on that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the next question, which is for Bill Campisi. Okay. It's number six, um, community advisory boards. 
uh, only KPFA and one other station of the five Pacifica stations are in compliance with the CPB requirements for having a CAB, a Community Advisory Board. Do you think having a functioning CAB is necessary? Why or why not? What are the primary roles of a functioning CAB? Um, you can start. Well, my experience of the CAB has been having the people who are directing our CAB come to LSB meetings and give reports about what they have learned from the community of KPFA listeners. So they go around with questionnaires to events like the Crafts Fair, for example, and provide listeners with, with questionnaires about various topics about the radio station. I have always thought that that was a important thing to do. I liked hearing the reports. I liked reading those reports. Um, the, the, the problem that we have, I think, is that a lot of people like to listen to the radio station. They want to turn it on. They want to hear our programming. They don't want to be involved with the radio station. They just like to hear, they just like to hear the programs. So we have, we have this democratic structure, but on the other hand, we have very limited participation. And so the CAB is helpful to a certain extent in terms of surveying um, our listenership as best they can. It's a lot of work, and it's, um, it's interesting. I haven't seen how we can use that information in our activities as an LSB. Thank you. Uh, Chris Cord? Would you mind repeating the question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so community advisory boards, uh, only KPFA and whether one other station of the five Pacifica stations are in compliance with the CPB requirements for having a com uh, community advisory board. Do you think having a functioning community advisory board is necessary? Why or why not? What are the primary roles of a functioning community advisory board? Well, I can answer the second half of the question first. Um, uh, or I guess there were three parts to that question. But um, uh, it's necessary because it's part of our compliance. It's, so it, in order for us to be compliant with the CPB, we have to have the, the community advisory boards. Um, as far as, uh, and so having them function probably makes sense as well because it's uh, pointless to have a, an advisory board which doesn't actually do anything. Um, I'd actually like to see the, the, uh, the CAB more uh, involved, more part of the overall structure of Pacifica even. Um, but it's difficult for me to fathom uh, how we could do, I, it, would, it might be better, it might be better for CABs to actually have, have a seat or, or present their um, findings to, to the national board rather than the local station board because there's a lot of really valuable information that comes out of their findings. Uh, they're the ones that actually do the outreach into the community and find uh, what people are interested in, what they want to hear, and uh, I, think, I just think that their input would be uh, valuable since we don't actually have much or, or even or, or even passing it through to the station manager, you know, somebody else who actually has authority over programming. Um, but uh, I've always found their, their reports, though, extremely interesting and detailed uh, to be kind of sur superfluous to uh, the functioning of the LSB. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Adams? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the CABs, the Community Advisory Boards, are required. Uh, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and also by our bylaws, so that's why they're necessary. Um, they're required by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in order to get funds, but funds are not coming to Pacifica <laughs> because there's many other things that are uh, causing, you know, many other violations within Pacifica, so there are no Corporation for Public Broadcasting funds coming. But nevertheless, we at KPFA have uh, continued our cab. And, you know, and it is required by the bylaws. And I actually want to set, thank Marianne Thomas, Rich Stone, and Craig Dunkerley, our current CAB members, because it is a lot of work to do that. And um, Craig Dunkerley is actually running for the LSB here, so uh, he will be leaving the CAB, and the CAB does need more people. So Thanks for it, that pitch. It, 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 it really does, and it is necessary, as I just said. They do the community needs assessment, and that is a very important thing, and it is interesting, and we find out what programs people like and things like that. They have been attending our LSB meetings and giving reports. So, yes, they are very important and necessary. Thank you. Uh, Bill Campisi? Will you address? Um, I, I don't have anything more to say on that topic. 
Okay, so moving on to the next question, um, number nine. Uh, what is your understanding of KPFAs and Pacifica's financial challenges, uh, and how do you pro propose to resolve these problems? Consider the deficit, consider current issues such as the pension funds of KPFA workers. Describe how you would work to resolve these issues. Man, yeah. that is a beautiful Morning. question. <laughs> so uh, uh, that is the million dollar question. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, could be done, should be done, and hopefully will be done in this year is to get us back uh, in compliance in terms of audits. Um, we've been uh, striving really hard. Uh, we have a new outside firm that's working on, on putting the audits together. Um, the timeline looks like it'll actually make it. Uh, and if it does, we'd be, el be eligible for CPB funding, which would be a million bucks, basically, um, for every year that we're in compliance. It's 10% of our overall funding. Um, we have not been getting it, and we've been running deficits in excess of that amount, so it would help close the gap significantly. Um, there's a whole bunch of other structural programming, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, program sharing, there's all sorts of things that could be done for, uh, for lowering the cost structure and raising the revenue of the organization. But getting into compliance with the, uh, with the audits would be um, a really easy win for the, for the organization. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Adams? Yes. Um, well, you did, you did ask about the pensions, and so I may have this not entirely correct because I didn't like review this before I came here. But if I recall correctly, um, the issue with the pensions is also part of the larger Pacifica issue. Um, and it goes to the governance structure of Pacifica and why it is so unwieldy. Um, I, as I understand from talking with our treasurer, KPFA's treasurer, uh, there, the KPFA was not allowed to fund the pensions because the entire organization had to fund the pensions at the same time. And one of the stations couldn't come up with about ten to $12,000 to fund their pension. Therefore, KPFA could not fund its pension, even though it had the money in the budget to do so. That's the kind of like you know management across the network that makes it so difficult and increases the cost you know, to KPFA, even when we had the money to do it at the time, now there's a greater uh, cost because they weren't the funds weren't put in at the time. So that's just one example of how the d financial situation is so difficult within Pacifica. Thank you. Bill Campisi? Yeah. So we have a $3.2 million loan that we had to take out because of a debt that was incurred uh, by, a state, by our New York station related to transmit, transmittal, transmitter lease that was signed, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and this loan could crush Pacifica and potentially crush KPFA. It's due and payable in a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, then there's this pension bill, which I think is close to a million bucks. Um, there's penalties associated with that probably. And the, the reason that Pacifica does not function properly is because of the structure. It's like five... It's like the Balkans. We have like five countries, five different stations. There's no national management that's effective because of the way the national board is set up. We're balkanized. And the, the three stations that are doing the worst in the network control the network, control the national board, or they can control it. Um, it's a terrible structure, and that's why Pacifica is failing. We have to change the structure if we want to have a national network. Thank you. Chris Corey? Um, yeah, I want to I want to thank Bill and Sharon for kind of picking up the loose ends of, of the discussion because it is a, it's a huge topic. It's an enormous topic and obviously it's a, a critical topic for the organization. Um, the uh, the debt structure, the the declining listenership, there's there's a, a whole bunch of factors that are leading us uh, off a cliff and something is going to have to be done over this next year. That's why it's very important to um, elect people who are smart and thoughtful and caring about this stuff uh, to their local station board so they can get elevated to the Pacific National Board because that's the path to, uh, to leadership for this organization. And uh, without good leadership, I, you know, I don't hold any hope for, for getting out of this. So we need people that'll work together 
uh, that have a common vision for, for uh, how to solve these problems. And, uh, and with, with that, um, I'm a lot more confident that we can get around this. Uh, right now it's very factional and uh, divided and it's hard to get anything done. So a more coherent management would be extremely, extremely valuable. Thank you. Um, so we can start the rotation again. Uh, so number 11 is going to Sharon, let's see. Um, okay, the vast majority of programming on KPFA is produced by unpaid staff. What are the pros and the cons of this? You have one minute. Okay, I did take notes. Um, I find that question sort of odd. I, I have to say when I was, I just found some of the questions maybe avoiding some of the main issues that I find to be relevant. And what I thought on that question is, there's fantastic programming that is produced by the unpaid staff, and there's fantastic programming produced by the paid staff. There's really mediocre programming that is produced by unpaid staff, and there's really mediocre pr programming that's produced by paid staff. <laughs> I like the quality of the programming, so I, I don't know. There's always been this divide between paid and unpaid, and um, from what I understand, it was created um, sort of artificially and through the greater Pacifica machinations. Again, I believe it came out of, um, I can't quite recall, but it used to be that, this is a lot of history, so, you know, but it used to be that uh, the union did represent the paid and unpaid staff and they wanted to continue, but for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, that was changed and now the union only represents the paid staff and that's what causes some of the difficulties. I do believe both are essential to running the station. Thank you. Bill Kempisi? Well, my attitude about programming is it's not in my bailiwick, nor do I think it's in the bailiwick of the LSB. What I think that we hire or should hire good managers, good program directors who have to balance old programming with new programming, whether it comes from paid programmers or unpaid programmers who, who create the program. The question is, is the programming good? And the LSB is not going to select programs and say to the manager, oh, you can't put this program in the air or you should put that program on the air. That's for the managers to do. Um, and our, this, our success as a station will be if we hire good managers who can feel what the public wants to hear on the left and produces good programming that gets listeners to come and listen to our station because the programming is provocative and interesting. And it's not up to the LSB to tell the, the manager or the program, programming director what to put on the station. We, because otherwise, we, you know, staff tries to draw the LSB into this fight frequently and, we're, and, and, and many of us say, no, we're not going to get in the middle of this. This is, we'll, we want to see if, if the station is successful, that is because the programming is good. Thank you. Chris Cord? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with Bill on this in that um, uh, we get approached a lot about this question, actually. It's, it's probably the most common thing. If I say, if I walk up to somebody, a friend of mine, and say, oh, I'm serving on the local station board, I, KPFA. Oh, can you do, can you get, uh, more, you know, hard knock radio back or whatever? You know, I mean, it's always that. It always goes to programming. It's always programming. And the LSB, unfortunately, has very, very little influence over programming. There is a, um, there is a programming committee uh, at the national level uh, that has some influence. Um, but uh, Bill's right. It is, it really does come down to management. So um, if we, uh, if we hire good managers, if we hire managers that are in accordance with the vision of our own station, uh, they will, they will, uh, they will seek out and find uh, the programming necessary to do that. Um, I, I, uh, I kind of enjoyed what uh, what Sharon had to say about the the kind of the qualitative nature of the programming, depending on uh, paid and unpaid staff. I hadn't really thought of it before, but I think that's that's that was a really good insight. That it it doesn't seem to matter that much. That the quality. Uh, has to do with the programmer, not uh, what their status is within the organization, and that has entirely to do with the person who does the, the hiring. So, Thank you. Uh, Sharon? I mean, I guess I would just like to say there's been this divide between the paid and the unpaid staff, uh, but I, I, and I'm not staff, and I don't spend a lot of time at the station, so I don't know, but it seems that perhaps the divide is going away. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I do know this. I mean, I don't know what's happening within staff. I just don't know. 
But I do know that Pacifica has just um, created an employee handbook, and it should perhaps um, ease some of the feelings of maybe that the unpaid staff was being treated differently than the paid staff, because I believe that the employee handbook will set standards that should apply to all, both paid and unpaid. Okay, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Next question, let's see, number 14 goes to Bill Campisi. Um, ah, this is actually sort shall we, this is, okay, you can tell me if we pick another question because it's very similar to the last one, but should the LSB involve itself in programming? Um, describe the extent of involvement and the pros and the cons. I feel like we've just talked about that. I don't know. Do, do you? Yeah, uh, I, I would sure. agree with yeah, that. Yeah, I, 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 do, I do think that you covered that um, in, in, in your responses is, is, to the is last that, one. Is that actually in the bylaws, by the way, Sharon? Yeah. You know, that's why I brought them specifically for that question. And the only power that the um, LSB has in terms of programming is it's rather long. As much well, as the we, bylaws. Got a, we got a little time here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we can take, take a pause from the format if you yeah, want yeah. to. To work with the station management, this is what the LSB should do, to work with station management to ensure that station programming fulfills the purposes of the foundation and is responsive to the diverse needs of listeners and communities served by the station, and that station policies and procedures for making programming decisions and for programming program evaluation are working in a fair, collaborative, and respectful manner to provide quality programming. Lots of words that say we really don't have any power. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, there, is the, there is kind of the key word of diversity in there, though, and I, I know that diversity is part of the, part of the mission of the yes. LSB to make sure that the, 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 the station maintains diversity. I, so then, I, so then I, perhaps, well, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, this is a, a little bit of an aside. One of the problems, I think, with the organizational structure of Pacifica is it, it, because it, I hate to say this, I'm a lawyer, and when I hear this distinction between paid and unpaid staff, I, I just get nervous, because that's not a legal distinction that has, I mean, there's employees and, and people who are agents and not employees. That's the legal distinction, and, and, and Pacifica tends to organize itself around different concepts other than legal concepts, which is okay unless something, unless a problem develops, like a lawsuit, and then suddenly the legal distinctions matter. And I haven't seen this employee handbook, but I'd be willing to bet you that no lawyer has reviewed this handbook and gone through it to see if it fits with certain important concepts about, about law. And that, that's, the whole, that's the whole problem with, with, with Pacifica. It just does whatever it wants who's ever there on a particular day or whatever without paying attention to, to things that need to be done. So, so actually, I think a more relevant question, which, is, uh, which specifically refers to um, the role of the, of the local station board, mm -hmm. um, is this one, and let me know. Uh, please describe the KPFA target audience. Is KPFA programming representative of the needs of listeners in the listening area? Mm -hmm. Please consider demographics, age, race, and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and political spectrum. Consider strategies for communicating with listeners to get their feedback. Well, again, you know, I like the programs that I listen to on KPFA. KPFA is a pretty successful station. It could be more successful, but it's a pretty successful station. It's the most successful station in the network. Um, it gets a lot of support in Northern California, relatively speaking. So what that tells me is that people want to hear the programming that we put out. I mean, there are a number of programs that I don't care for. For example, I'm not particularly excited by herbal medicine, you know, so I don't listen to that program, you know. Um, but I, but I, love, I love the news. I love certain music programs. So um, I, I, how I gauge how we're doing in terms of our programming, what I, what I know about it is what I see in terms of our fundraising. Now, I do think there should be more outreach to younger people, and I do think we should do that through high schools, and I do think we should, we should invite kids who, young people who are interested in journalism to come to our station and put on some programs ab about what's going on in their lives in their high schools. 
Uh, I think we need more of that. We're, we're too old. Um, and they could teach us something about podcasts and stuff like that. So I think there should be more outreach to the youth. Uh, and I've said that before. Thank you. Chris Corey? So the, the question was, uh, what, what demographics are we, uh, is, are, are, we, um, are we trying to reach, I guess? That was the basic gist of the and question. Does, and, right? and, and, and does programming represent it? And, and any strategies to uh, rectify that if it doesn't? Okay. Yeah, w once again, I mean, it's not really the LSB's responsibility to, to be involved with this. But just to answer the question in, in the abstract. Oh, sorry. I, I just, uh, just because I, you know, we did just read in the bylaws oh, the other one? Yeah. Um, that it is listed in there that it is part of the responsibility to ensure that station programming fulfills the purposes right. and is okay. responsive so to the needs of the So we're talking about purposes. Basically. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Um, the, so mission, that, that's, the mission of the station. Right, right. Okay. That's, yeah. that's actually that, yeah, okay. I, 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 that's the more parallel. Or less the station. Okay, I, I mean yeah. more or less the question, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, uh, no, that's fine. So um, in terms of uh, uh, what demographics we're, we're trying to reach and serve, uh, in, uh, the, uh, you know, the greater Bay Area listening audience is the one that we're after, but it's a wide and diverse group. I think that, uh, that the way we do things is more well suited to people who are not interested in, in listening to mainstream programming. So there's a whole, and that's a very wide swath of, of uh, material. It's also um, a somewhat narrower demographic than, than just taking the greater Bay Area region. Um, but uh, just in terms of the, uh, the, the mission of the station, it would be to, uh, to give an alternative voice to, to, um, to public affairs, to, pro, uh, to musical programming, to, and to serve under, underserved groups. And, um, uh, you know, once again, this, uh, this is kind of a management level uh, issue that needs to be uh, taken care of, and it's up to the managers to do it, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the function of the station and, and the audience that it's trying to reach. I agree with Bill that we, need to, we definitely need to target, target younger people. It's, uh, it, it worries me. The long-term prospects for the station worry me to have a, uh, an older audience that's slowly declining in number and, uh, and to not have uh, enough outreach to younger people. Thank you. Uh, Sharon? <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I really like what Chris said about uh, that our audience is the greater Bay Area listening audience, and I, I tend to agree with that. And I think there's a deep, deep hunger for truth. That's what I feel. I feel there's a hunger for truth. And I actually take in a lot of different media, and I've heard that millennials are now 40% of the voting population. And of course, they're going to be a large part of our listening audience. And millennials also are very skeptical, skeptical about news sources, and they won't just believe something that they hear on the radio or, or on the internet. They will check out their sources. So when I hear stuff that I have heard on KPFA that is, not, uh, that is perhaps a little bit mm, partisan, um, I think that it's, it's somewhat, this is just my opinion, but I think that people that are seeking truth are not going to be drawn to that. So I really believe that we need to have a very strong emphasis on factual truth telling. And one of the examples that I want to give is Jimmy Dore, the Jimmy Dore show. He actually is on uh, KPFK because he's out of LA. So KPFA could run his show through Audioport and I really wish they would because I, uh, he has a show on YouTube and uh, about a month ago, I started watching his show, and he had 440,000 subscribers. Okay, not paid, but subscribers on YouTube. And in the past month, he grew 25,000 subscribers. That's more than we have as members of KPFA. So he's saying something that people want to hear. And that's what I think we need. We need, we need very critical uh, analysis of the very difficult times that we live in right now. That's what I think would really help all people. Thank you. Um, Bill? Well, yeah, I, I was just thinking of the range of programming that we put on that is different from other media or what other media present. And I was thinking about um, our programs on socialist and radical economics that we put on that you don't hear a lot of or hear at all in other stations. Um, we have strong programming in support of the Palestinians. Again, you don't hear that anywhere else in media, I don't think, much. Um, uh, I, 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 we just have programming about different parts of the world. I'm thinking of Voices of the Middle East, which I 
program I like very much. Uh, again, you're, you just don't hear the same points of view uh, and the same voices on other stations. So we are reaching audiences in a way that is not available in other, from, from other stations. The other, but the other thing that we need to do is, and this is where the kids come in, um, is because of the way media is now being presented through the internet and podcasts, things I don't really understand, we, we need to get an, an understanding of how to use the new media to deliver content that people want to hear. And for that, I think we've got to get younger people involved in our station. Thank you. So let's see. We're moving on to... It's, me. it's you next, right? Yeah, <laughs> so let's see. Number 15. What is number 15? Didn't we just do 15? We, I think we that did was 11. We did 14. 14. Oh, we did 14. Okay. okay. Um, this is... Again, and I think we, if you know, if you want to uh, skip a question, it's it, we can do that too. Um, this is back on programming, which is why. <laughs> do we need a program council? If one were to exist, would it be uh, uh, who would be on it, and how would they get on it? What are the pros and cons of having a, a program council? Okay, well, I can I can kind of answer that question uh, without just simply brushing it off, and and that's that we do kind of have a program council, but it's at the the national level. Um, we might, do we have a local, do we have one for the other? I didn't think so. So the, there's, a, um, uh, there's a programming committee that's a subcommittee of the Pacific National Board. And of course, you have to, the, uh, the path to the national board is through the LSB. So people that are on the LSB can run for this committee. Um, and they, they, do have some, they do have some influence over, uh, over uh, programming organizational-wide, especially, organization -wide, especially kind of the vision of how that's to be done. Not, not, the, not specifically what it is, but how it is to be done. So, for example, um, this idea of program sharing has become kind of popular in the network right now where, uh, you know, there, there, there are successful programs in every station, in every market. Uh, and sometimes the markets don't have enough overlap to, to make it work. Um, at, at, uh, for every single station, but sometimes the markets do have enough overlap for it to work with one or with more than one station. And in situations like that, there's a great economic advantage to being able to share that programming with that other station. So basically what it is, the idea, the concept, is to share programming that's successful in other stations with stations that are less, either less successful or could use that, uh, that programming for, for a shared demographic. So. Thank you. Um, Sharon? Um, well, program the program c council did exist in the past. It was something that was part of KPFA, and as I understand it, it uh, was responsible for bringing some uh, good programs to KPFA. And I really don't know the history of why it is no longer um, there, but it does kind of get to that same question of the power over programming. And you know, it's interesting because listeners, it is what they talk to us about. <laughs> really they is. always it want really to talk is. about programming and we really have no power over it. And I, I want to say our general manager, Quincy McCoy, um, has come to, a, or I'm not sure when he said this, but he said to me, uh, he considers himself to be the steward of the airwaves. And I believe that we, uh, at least I believe the local station board should support him. I believe he has been a good steward. I think the numbers of our membership, the fact that we have the greatest membership within the Pacifica network show that he has been a good steward and I feel that um, that's where I kind of come down on the programming issue. Thank you. Um, Bill? Yeah. Um, there have been people who've been involved with uh, KPFA and Pacifica for 20, 30, 40 years. They know the history of the fight around program councils. Um, those people do not share that history with those of us who are newer to the station. But you can hear it. There's, there's rumblings about it. And I think that may break down along the paid and unpaid staff. So we'll, we'll hear from some of the other members of the LSB, you know, well, how do you make programming decisions? What about these program councils? Well, someone will bring it up. But they won't discuss the history. And I, and I don't know what that history is. But there's been a big fight around this, and it's led to some of the factionalism, or it's part of the factionalism. That's why our group's called United for Independent Radio, because we're trying to get the factions to come together. 
So this, there's been a lot of warfare around the issue of program councils. And I've invited some of the people who, uh, who are in favor of program councils, who are not part of our group, to come forward and tell me why they think it would be a good thing to have program councils and tell me what was the problem with them before that led to their demise, because they did exist, et cetera, et cetera. But that never happens. But there is this undercurrent. So my attitude towards it is, I'm going to let the manager and the program director make decisions about programming, because I don't know how anybody gets onto a program council. You know, I could keep talking, sorry. But anyway, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Okay. I mean, you have another minute to readdress. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all right. The, uh, um, uh, I'm not going to take up much time because I actually don't know the history. I, um, uh, it is so I, I have, I've never, I've actually never heard the term program council before tonight. So oh. I, you know, I've been serving on the board for uh, three years, but prior to that, I was just a listener, just a listener um, <laughs> out there listening to the radio station. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I yeah, I don't know much of the, the history of the governance of the, of the organization. Um, it's been an interesting learning curve for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, no, anyway, no, no. I, uh, I, I guess what I would say, just to sum it up, is that I, I don't have any particular objection to the idea of program councils, but I assume that they're not there for a reason within the LSB. Um, and, you know, I'd be interested in hearing about that, but I don't know enough to speak on it. So we're going to close. <laughs> yeah. This Start with first this. debate uh, with um, two rounds okay. of closing statements. All right. Okay. Sharon, um, Sharon I just would Adams. like to say, yes, uh, thank you, Renee, for doing this and for hosting this um, and for all that you've been doing as the National Election Supervisor. Um, yes, I'm a member of United for uh, Independent Radio also, and I think all of us here on this particular panel are, and we have worked together. I also have just uh, joined the... LSB three years ago and was just a listener prior to that also. So it has been quite a learning curve about there's so much history and it, it's always convoluted and never as clear as you think it is when you first hear a story. Um, my thought for the future of KPFA and Pacifica is that we need to expand into social media that is relevant to young people. Your question before about getting into diverse communities sort of assumes that young people listen to radio, and pretty much all the young people I've talked to don't, period. They just do not. But you know, YouTube is, is huge, um, and of course Facebook and all these things, so I think it would be very nice for KPFA to expand um, its model. And I guess I'll wait for my next minute to explain maybe how I think that could work. Okay. Thank you. Bill? Okay, well, what I'm mostly interested in, what I'm working on, uh, is a rewrite of the bylaws. I mean, my view is this. If you're going to have a national organization, then you can't have directors solely from each of the stations. Right now we have four directors from each of the five stations. And that just leads to incredible um, factionalism and balkanization. And essentially each station wants to operate as an independent entity and yet any decision made by the, each separate station has legal effects and creates legal obligations on all the other stations. And so right now, um, it, it, that, that is not a model that can, can exist. So we need a different structure for, for the board. And I'm working on a different structure that has at-large directors as well as station directors. And the at-large directors are designed to look at the network as a whole and to approach the, the issue of governance as a whole um, so, that we can, so that we can operate as a national network if we're going to have a national network. network. Thank you. That's my Chris Gordon. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, Renee. Um, you, uh, you're a powerhouse. You're doing, uh, you're doing like five jobs right now, and I just don't understand <laughs> how you do it. Um, but uh, yeah, my, uh, like I said uh, in my opening statement, my, my primary focus is the financial condition of the, or the organization as a whole. And uh, uh, Bill's right, it, it, the ticking time bomb out there is the $3.2 million uh, loan, which we're currently not paying in, any interest on. It's coming out of, um, it's coming out of an escrow account. Um, 
and once those escrow funds are used up, we'll have to start paying interest on the loan. That's the first whammy. Um, that'll be in the, if I remember correctly, it's it's in the twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar a month range. The interest, which isn't overwhelming, uh, but uh, then the balloon payment comes due when the loan comes due, and that'll be the full three point the full force of the three point two million dollar loan will come down on the throat of Pacifica. And at that point in time, if we don't have our ducks in, in, in a row, um, it's going to create an, another crisis very similar to the one that we've endured over the last couple of years. And I will, uh, in my second minute, <laughs> explain how we might uh, get around that. Thank you. Sharon? Okay. I just want to sort of pick up a little bit on what uh, Chris was saying because, yes, I think the financial uh, situation of Pacifica as a whole is huge. And it's a big, big issue. Um, on the other hand, being on the local station board, I don't have a lot of power to do anything about that. Chris is on the national, the Pacifica National Board now, so he, he has more uh, influence in that. But to finish what I was saying before um, about uh, the model, I think, you know, for example, um, some news networks like the Real News Network has a model where you subscribe monthly and you can get unlimited streaming of their content. Otherwise, their content is free. So there's different models for generating revenue within KPFA and within Pacifica as a whole. And that's what I would like to do. People use Patreon as a way to uh, fund um, individual programming. And I think there might be a way to do that for KPFA because we have content. KPFA has a lot of great content. and. You know, to use a capitalistic word, we need to monetize our content because so many sites don't have content. <laughs> and yet, they, you know, so I think that there's a way to um, go forward. I know some people within Pacifica are trying to push for underwriting as a way to c overcome our financial issues, and I really disagree with that as a strategy. I think it's much better to focus on our content and using different models to uh, help pay you know, maybe people would subscribe to different levels of content, or I don't know how it could work out, but that's where I would like to see things go. Thank you. Sharon Adams. Thank you. Bill well, Davis. to return to the subject of national management or, uh, of the five stations, our listeners should understand that three of the five stations are failing financially. Um, they're in very bad shape. Um, but national management has a great deal of difficulty doing anything about that, again, because of the structure of the organization. Um, KPFA, with its 16,000, 17,000 members, can amend the bylaws. The members can amend the bylaws of Pacifica. Um, there's a way to do it. And uh, so it's not just a pie in the sky idea. The national board is not going to amend the bylaws that would put them out of existence in their current form. That's not going to happen. But the members can do that. But it would take a lot of effort on the part of a large number of KPFA subscribers. Um, they'd have to endorse a set of bylaws and vote in large numbers to pass them. And then they would then constitute the bylaws of the organization. We could change the structure of the organization. Thank you, Bill Campisi. Yeah. Chris Corey? Yeah. So uh, um, uh, getting back to the issue of finance for, for the organization, um, when the loan comes due, uh, there's the, I think the primary uh, thought right now is that we'll simply refinance the loan. But unfortunately, that does not fix the problem because the loan will still exist. The debt will still exist. We're just kicking the can down the road and collecting interest on that debt, which reduces the amount of working capital that the business has to operate with. So. Um, it's it's uh, it may be a short term band aid to fix the pro fix the problem, but it doesn't actually solve it. And there's only three ways out of this. One is to cut costs, which everybody hates and is generally not a very good idea because they tend to be cut in the wrong places, especially with ineffective management. Um, the second is to raise revenue, which everybody wants to do. Everybody wants to do it, but I have to say I've been here uh, in this organization for three years and we have not done it. Um, and I don't think we've done it in the last 13 years. So I'm not confident about raising revenue either. And the third way to do it is to sell assets, which is unfortunately, I think, uh, where this is heading. And so unless this organization can, can come to grips with some of these 
bigger issues, uh, the ability to, to raise uh, revenue by working together as a collective organization, we are going to eventually be up against the wall and have to sell assets. That's the only way that we're going to get out of this. And, uh, you know, I hate to be the bearer of the hard truth, but I think that is the hard truth. Well, thank you very much. I think this closes uh, the debate. Um, I was joined by Sharon Adams, Bill Campisi, and Chris Corey. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please find more information on elections.pacifica.org and please vote. The election closes March 5th. So, and contact me uh, and I'll put some contact information here. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.